Welcome back. In this first of a four-part video series, we're gonna study the first journey of Paul and his coworkers. The time of this journey was from AD 47 to AD 49, so about two years. The primary regions covered were Cyprus and Galatia. In this video, we're going to study Acts 13 and 14, and we're going to ask four primary questions. The main questions are, where did they go? What did they do? What did God do? Or what were the results? And do we see any of the priorities and practices of Acts 2, the first church? If this is your first time with us, I highly encourage you to go back to the five-part video series on the expansion of the first church from Jerusalem to Antioch. And you'll see over these five parts that the gospel has expanded from Jerusalem all the way to Antioch. So on our map here, I have in yellow the places where the gospel has been expanding for the first 20 to 25 years of Christianity before Paul and Barnabas are sent out of Antioch. For this study, as in the previous study, you're going to need a map and you're going to need a piece of paper here that has the five parts and four fields of kingdom growth and the priorities and the practices of the first church as seen in Acts 2, 36-47. So to draw a map, you can either copy this one, download the one in the description, or you can simply turn to the back of your Bible and look for the map that looks like this. Once you have a map drawn out and this piece of paper drawn out, you can begin to study Acts 13 and 14 and ask yourselves the questions. Where did they go? So that's entry. Who did they begin to speak with? How did they begin to speak with them? How did they share the gospel? What did it look like to make disciples? Where do we see church gathering? Where do we see leadership development? Also, if you see any notes on how they proclaim the gospel specifically, what did repentance and belief look like? What about baptism, the Holy Spirit, teaching of the Word of God, fellowship and love, breaking of bread, prayer, signs and wonders, generosity, worship, anywhere it says increase, add, multiply, or anywhere where you begin to see discipleship multiplying out, and then also any instances where you see persecution. Also, on your map, you can draw out where they went, which is, again, sent out from Antioch, going down to Cyprus, and up to Antioch and Pisidia, and through the region of Pisidia and Galatia. Take all the time you need, do the study, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. I hope you had plenty of time to study. So as we said, we're going to answer the questions, where did they go? What did they do? What did God do? The results. And what are the priorities and the practices of Acts 2, 30, 60, 47, as seen in these chapters? If you would like to also study Galatians, um, after Paul writes Acts 13 and 14, he writes the letter of Galatians that circulated throughout these churches to see more of the priorities and the practices of the first church that Paul was discipling through, particularly issues having to do with the gospel, repentance and belief, and the Holy Spirit. So where did they go? We see that they were sent out by the Holy Spirit for the work from Antioch. We see that the leaders were worshiping and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have for them to do. So they laid hands on them, they prayed, they fasted, and they sent them off. We see all the places that they went. They started at the island of Cyprus, which, as you remember, is the island where Barnabas is from. So really, they're going back to Barnabas's oikos. After sharing throughout the whole island of Cyprus, they enter into Perga. John Mark returns to Jerusalem. They continue on throughout the rest of the journey, the two-year period, uh, through Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Some notes about who they were engaging as they entered into each one of these places is they started in the synagogue, so they started with the Jews, but we also see that the Greeks and the Gentiles and even the people group in Lystra who speak Lyconian were engaged as well. There's even a brief note that they entered into and spoke the word in Perga on their way home. So that was where they went. How did they share the gospel? We see very clearly that they proclaimed the word in Cyprus throughout the whole island. When they got to Antioch and Pisidia, we see an incredible presentation from Abraham all the way to Christ. It says once they got to Iconium that they spoke boldly. Again in Iconium, we see that they spoke and they spoke the word. 
Acts 14.7 says that they continued to preach the gospel throughout Lystra, Derby, and the surrounding country. In Acts 14.15 in Lystra, they were clearly proclaiming the gospel, as it said up here in 14.7, and a crippled man was healed, and they began to be worshipped as Zeus and Hermes, but they corrected this, going back to creation and saying, no, we are just people worship the true God. It says in Acts 14.21, again, that they preached the gospel in Derby, and then they even spoke the word in Perga on their way home. So they were clearly proclaiming the gospel. What about for discipleship? We see the teaching of the word of the Lord in Cyprus to the new believer Sergius Paulus, who was the proconsul of the island. In 1343, we see that Jews and converts of Judaism follow Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, Pisidia. We see that Paul and Barnabas exhort them to continue in the grace of God. In 1348, it says that the word of the Lord spread through the Gentiles there in Antioch, Pisidia, once they received it. So this is an element of discipleship, obviously, new believers proclaiming the word of the Lord. In 1401, we see in Iconium that they stayed there for a long time with the new believers. In 1440, 14 through 18, we see they corrected the wrong worship in Lystra. In 1420, we see that the disciples after Paul is stoned gathered around him. So clearly they were making disciples in Lystra if disciples had to gather around him. In 1421, it says that they made many disciples in Derby, And we see a very clear indication of what the new discipling of these believers looked like. It said they strengthened and encouraged them. And they told them through many trials and tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. And then obviously we see more discipleship as they return back to the church at Antioch and stay there for no little time. What about for church? We clearly see a healthy church, a mature church in Antioch who is worshiping the Lord and fasting and sending out their best leaders. We see Acts 14.20 that the disciples gathered around Paul, which again is a function of church gathering. And then we see in 1423 that Paul was not just making disciples. He was not just sharing the gospel. He was not just entering into these empty fields, but he started churches. It says that they returned to every church from Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, Pisidia. And it said that they appointed leaders or elders in each one of these churches. In Acts 14.27, it says again that they gathered with the church back in Antioch to declare all that the Lord had done. And the 1426, kind of the bookmark from the beginning. In Acts 13, 1, it says the Holy Spirit said, Set Paul and Barnabas apart for the work I have called them to. In 1426, when they return, it says that they declared the work that they had fulfilled, that they had completed. So we begin to see what the work is. The work is entering into the empty field, sowing the seed of the gospel, making disciples, gathering churches, and appointing leaders. Some other notes on the leadership development we see that there are prophets and teachers in the work of Antioch. And a function of these leaders we see is that they lay hands and send out Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. In 1313, we see that John Mark leaves, but it says that he was there in verse 5 as an assistant for Paul and Barnabas. In 148, we know on the next journey that Timothy comes from either Derby or Lystra, and it says he's well spoken of throughout the region, that became a believer generationally in the wake of this first missionary journey through both his grandmother and his mother's faith. And again, in 1423, we see elders appointed with prayer and fasting in these brand new churches. What about the instances we see here of the priorities and the practices of the first church? Let's recount how many times we see each one of these. All right, after counting them up, there was 15 clear indicators of the gospel being proclaimed. And I wrote down any indicator where it talked about proclamation. And even I indicated the seven references to the Old Testament that Paul and Barnabas quote when they're sharing the gospel in Antioch Pisidia. Seven times we see reference to belief or faith or turning to the Lord or appointed to eternal life or a door of faith being opened. Now, we don't see any instances of baptism. However, as we can remember with Luke's pattern when he's writing, normally when he mentions one of the words, repent, believe, faith, turn to the Lord, or baptism, all of those things were happening at the same time. So just because Luke doesn't mention it does not mean it was not happening. So just as was the pattern from Acts 1 to Acts 12 that new believers were baptized, those who repented and believed were likely also baptized 
and filled with the Holy Spirit. We see four references to the Holy Spirit, and we see very clearly that these new Gentile disciples in Acts 13, 52 and in Acts City are filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. How are they filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, we see clearly in Galatians 3, 13 through 14, a lot of teaching about the Holy Spirit. And most in particular, we see that they receive the Holy Spirit by faith. We see eight times that the Word of God is mentioned. And a note about the teaching of the Word of God. All but one instance where it talks about the Word of God is in a context of entry and evangelism. It was the Word of God being proclaimed or the gospel being proclaimed. There was only one time that you might be able to say that the teaching of the Word of God was directed more to new disciples. And this would be in Acts 14.3 when it says, So they remained there for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to being done by their hands. So they remained in Iconium for a long time, proclaiming the word. But the rest of the context of the use of proclaim or to preach the word was all in an evangelistic context. For fellowship and love, we see four instances. For breaking of bread, we don't see any, but we assume that they were breaking bread together. For prayer, we see three times that it's mentioned. And in particular, we see that the church is fasting and praying before they send them off. And just as Paul and Barnabas were sent out through fasting and prayer and the laying of of hands, new elders were appointed by fasting and prayer. Signs and wonders. We see that Elimaeus in Cyprus is blinded by Paul. In Acts 14.3, we see a very clear indicator of what the purpose of signs and wonders is. It says, So they remained there a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done through their hands. So the signs and wonders are pointing to the proclamation of the gospel. The signs and wonders were giving witness to the power of the gospel as the apostles proclaimed it. 1411, we see a crippled man in Lystra who had faith. and 1420, we also see Paul was stoned to death outside of Lystra, apparently was resurrected and walks back into the town. We don't see any times generosity is mentioned, but we can assume that the new disciples were being generous. We see three times that worship is mentioned or joy. We see the leaders in the first church were worshiping the Lord and fasting in Antioch. And we see four times where it mentions an increase, add, or multiplication. Obviously, with the proconsul believes, it says that the Gentiles spread the word throughout the region, which is a very clear indicator that new believers were spreading the gospel. In 1422, we see that many disciples were made. And in 1427, how the Lord opened the door to the Gentiles. Four times there was persecution here in these chapters. And what's interesting is it begins to ramp up. First, they're kind of harassed in Antioch. And so they shake the dust from their feet, which is a part of what Jesus commanded them to do all the way back in Luke 10. He said, if they don't receive you, shake the dust from your feet and go to the next town. So they shake the dust from their feet and they go on to Iconium. In Iconium, again, they are threatened and they leave before this threat can actually be carried out on their life. In 1419, we see that the Jews from both Iconium and Antioch Pisidia come all the way down to Lystra and they stone Paul. And in 1422, we see that this persecution was a part of Paul's teaching for new believers. He said, through many tribulations, we should enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is an overview of Paul and Barnabas and John Mark's first journey. The primary regions reached were Galatia, Antioch, Pisidia, and Cyprus. For further reading on how Paul continued to disciple this first church before he returned on his second journey, read the letter of Galatians, because as soon as Paul came back to Antioch, he wrote the letter of Galatians to circulate throughout the churches. I hope you really enjoyed this study. Take what you've learned here Apply it to your life and teach others to do likewise until there's no place left. And stick around for the next video where we cover Paul and his co-workers' second missionary journey all the way over to Macedonia and Achaia. We'll see you next time.